Hello again. Guess what, guys? It's the last chapter. The last chapter of our novel. The last chapter. So proud of you guys. You've made it all the way through. And this is not a light novel to be entertained by. You guys have already read 254 pages. So let's go ahead and start our last chapter. It's called Epilogue, whatever that means. And just so I can go ahead and keep you informed, epilogue, when you're thinking about author's use of that um, phrase, epilogue usually is the way that a book ends and it kind of wraps up everything, but possibly not in a sequential, like right after the fact, based on what we just finished in chapter 26. Epilogues tend to look into the future a little bit and maybe kind of give you an idea of how everything's going to wrap up for the characters. Um, and that's what this chapter is going to do for us. Okay, so epilogue, whatever that means. There is a good crowd on hand for the winter concert. I have made a miraculous recovery and have healed enough to be sitting in my old spot in the brass section, holding my tuba that is not a tuba, watching Mr. Steenwillie conduct his way through the opening bars of the love song of the bullfrog. When my solo comes along, I'm nervous that my chipped teeth and wired together jaw will put a damper on my rendition, but I have underestimated the magical healing power of music. Just play, and it will all take care of itself, Mr. Steenwillie advised me before we went on stage, and indeed, that is exactly what happens once I start. With 500 people listening, I nail the tuba solo, and when I finish with one last lingering throaty note, the audience does not wait for the piece to end. They erupt with applause and a chant of, John, John, John. Unfortunately, none of this actually takes place. I am indeed at the winter concert, and the band is about to play the love song of the bullfrog, but I am not seated on stage with the other members of the band family. It is impossible to play a tuba when your jaw is wired shut, and there is a plaster cast covering much of your face. I still can't eat solid food, I can't whistle, I can't hum, and I certainly can't play the love song of the bullfrog on my tuba that is not a tuba. My tuba has become a tuba because it is now being played by one of the most eminent musicologists of the modern era. And I'll tell you how this came about. Apparently, my severe beating at the hands of the man who was not my father was reported in several local newspapers. Old Professor Kachuski read about what happened to me and the man with the golden ear also turns out to have a golden heart. He called up Mr. Steenwillie to find out what hospital I was in, and then he came to see me and asked if he could have the honor of filling in for me at the winter concert. There is a long and honorable tradition of one musician sitting in for another in emergency circumstances so that the show may go on, he explained. The tuba was one of my first instruments. An author has worked so hard on that piece. We really must find a way to do it justice and let his frog sing, if you don't mind. I nodded my agreement. The show must go on. I have reminded myself of that basic truth many times during my rather painful convalescence. There have been several operations involving reconstructive surgery and dentistry that have, that have left me with long hours of throbbing pain. But I have one condition, Kachuski said unexpectedly. Since you practice this piece so hard, and since I understand the solo was written for you, I would like to play it on your own tuba as a sort of testimonial to you, if you don't mind. I debated telling Kachuski that my tuba is dead, that he was present, and in fact blown off his chair in, at its demise. But I decided to keep this information to myself. After all, he is a world-renowned musicologist with a golden ear, and I am a 14-year-old boy with a mashed face. So now I'm sitting on the fifth bleacher of our anti-school gymnasium with my mother on one side of me and Violent Hayes' mountain gorilla of a father on the other. On the bleacher just in front of me sits good old Mrs. Moonface, tapping her toe to the beat as our band wraps up a march by John Philip Sousa. On this cold winter evening, our band sounds remarkably good. It is a strange thing, 
I never practiced my tuba much, and I played in the band only because I was forced to do so by the high command of our anti-school, but I now find myself wishing very much that I was up on stage. Arthur Flemingham Steen Willie skewers the end of the Sousa march with a few deft final swipes of his baton and turns to face the audience in his new black coat with shiny buttons. The tips of his mustache, which have, I believe, been trimmed and waxed for this important occasion. Bungie jumped down from his face to turn the page, end the score in front of him, and then spring back into place. He smiles out at us. It's clear that he has brought much light to our anti-school in this thankless crusade. We would like to play one final piece for you, he says. I ask your indulgence. It was not written by a famous composer, but by a young man with a lot to learn. It's called The Love Song of the Bullfrog. He begins to turn back to the band and then stops and clears his throat. This piece features a tuba solo. It was written for a promising musician and our band who cannot perform it tonight, but he's here in this hall and we'd like to dedicate it to him. John, would you please stand up? I did not expect this. I do not particularly want to stand up. My face, never a work of art, even in, even in its best days, is still black and blue from the beating that the man who was not my father administered. I believe several of my most prominent facial features have been permanently rearranged. A large cast is the most egregious damage, and I have wished that it was even larger, that it covered my entire face, except perhaps a breathing hole and two eye slits. The best thing to do with a face like the one I am wearing on this winter evening is to keep it well hidden. But everyone's looking at me. That's you, Johnny boy, the mountain gorilla exclaims. Go ahead, my mom says, stand up. Suddenly, I find myself on my feet. I duck my head once or twice in some kind of an awkward bow and sit back down again as quickly as I can. The crowd is so pleased that the boy with the mashed face has sat down and the concert can now continue that they break into applause. They're clapping for you, my mother says. No, mother, they're not clapping for me. They are clapping for themselves to appease their own guilt at having done nothing to prevent my brutal treatment. That is why Dr. Whitefield is standing and clapping so hard that his massive eyebrows shake like tropical flora raked by typhoon winds. That is why his sadistic second-in-command Mr. Kessler applauds with the same hands he used to drag me down the hallway. Glory Hallelujah is also standing, but I don't believe she's clapping at all. I believe she's using this opportunity to stand and show off her new slinky outfit, which may indeed not, which may indeed not be clothing at all, but rather body paint on naked skin. My mother unexpectedly leans over and gives me a kiss. She doesn't actually make contact with me. She kisses a corner of my face cast. I twist away and say, Mom, because public displays of affection from mothers are strictly prohibited in our anti-school gymnasium. But I suppose it's not an entirely bad thing that she is fond of her son. Mr. Steenwilly turns back to the band and raises his baton. Down comes his right arm, and the piece starts. On my right side, I can feel the mountain gorilla tense up, but he need not be worried. Violent haze nails the opening saxophone interlude. She's looking particularly fetching tonight in a long blue dress with a red ribbon in her hair, and I suppose the monitor lizard that pretends to be her saxophone is as charmed as I am. Andy Pierce follows up with the drum segue. I hear a few minor traffic violations, and there's a long screeching of tires. One jarring fender bender makes Mr. Steenwilly wince, as if a ferret has just crawled out of the kettle drum and bitten his ankle. But Andy has done far worse in his time. Meanwhile, the tuba solo is swimming toward Professor Kachuski. Swimming like a giant stingray with a few thousand volts to spare. But even from where I sit, I can see that eminent musicologists have no fear of solos, stingrays, or even tubas that are really dead frogs. Kachuski is a pro. At precisely the correct millisecond, he begins the solo. 
Oddly, no music comes out of his tuba that is really my tuba. There's no love song at all. Instead, I hear the disembodied voice of a dead frog, a ghostly amphibious voice that floats out over the large hall, speaking to me and me alone. Once upon a time, there was a boy who was lucky enough to survive a war, but not wise enough to count his blessings, the voice says. He had a mashed face and he wanted to hide it from the light. People clapped for him and he remembered old wrongs. Foolish lad, he had survived a war and expected the world to be a beautiful and blissful place. But, the disembodied frog continues, a war zone remains bleak, even after the last gun has been silenced. The boy's real father will not suddenly appear. He is probably in jail or dead. Algebra will still be algebra with its many hairy legs and poisonous pincers. His friends will still on occasion liken him to carry on, and no doubt for good reason. Anti-school will still be anti-school, and members of the secret sorority of pretty 14-year-old girls will still turn up their noses at him, if given a chance. Kachuski is nearing the end of the tuba solo. His old face has turned red with the effort of sustained exhalation, whatever that means, but despite his best efforts, he is still not producing any music. The disembodied frog voice squeaks faster, speaks faster, and in a slightly more encouraging tone. The boy should not, however, be completely dismayed, the voice says. There are occasionally a few bright moments that flash in the darkness. Lily ponds buzzing with fat flies on autumn evenings. Algebra teachers with pasty faces but good hearts. Brave pet dogs who try to protect their masters despite peril to life and limb, and who now keep them company during their convalescence. Mothers who try to cheer up their hospitalized kids by playing checkers with them and repeating silly jokes they heard at the factory that day. Saxophone players with ribbons in their hair and brown eyes as big and soft as butternut squashes. And if the boy learns to recognize such moments and savor them, infrequent and transitory though they may be, he may find they make the whole shebang worthwhile. Kachuski plays a long, last, lingering, throaty note and lowers my tuba. The crowd, still and silent, as stone statues, listen as if a magical spell has been cast over them. There must be dust in the gymnasium because I find that my eyes are wet. Mr. Steenwilly accentuates the last notes of his masterpiece with a few final dramatic flourishes of his baton, and then turns to the audience and bows. People stand and clap. I remain seated, self-conscious about again showing off my many bruises and ridiculous face cast. My old and tired mother, who is not known as a big music fan, jumps to her feet and claps as if her palms have caught fire and she is trying to beat out the flames. The mountain gorilla also stands and pounds his massive paws together, beaming proud glances at his daughter. Violent Hayes looks back at him. Looks back at him from the stage, her face shining. Her gaze swings from the mountain gorilla to me, and for a moment we have a little silent communication, just the two of us. It may be a good thing that I'm wearing a face cast because I believe I'm blushing beneath it. Among the Lashasa Palulu, that tribe that is not a tribe, battle heroes who have been wounded in action are never given medals. They wear their scars as the proof of their bravery, and at village festivals they are seated in prominent positions and expected to lead the celebrations. Mashed face and all, I stand up and clap with the rest of them. As I blink away the puddles of moisture that my eyes are pumping out, no doubt to dispel the irritation of airborne dust, I am forced to admit that Mr. Steenwilly caught a true emotion and set it down in sharps and flats, and Kachuski nailed the tubu solo for him. And I understand that forlorn and cautionary as it started out, and muddled and painful as it became in places, it was, in the end, a love song. <laughs>